Aren't you glad He is sovereign over us? Amen. Amen. If you're joining with us for the first time, we are, or you haven't been in a while, we are in our third message in a series that we have entitled Seven. Seven, as we look for seven weeks in the next, uh, well, actually the next, what, four weeks now, but in uh, seven weeks total, we are looking at seven men who were chosen to be servants in the church for the responsibility of demonstrating His kingdom. We first witnessed the choosing of the seven. That was our first message. As we saw God establish the priority of declaring the Word of God while ensuring that through the de- declaration of the Word, the church is not neglecting, demonstrating the way in which that Word was to be lived. Last week, we saw one of the seven, one of the leaders of the seven, one of the ones that we are going to be following this week, last week, this week, and next week, uh, we saw the, the first of the seven get arrested by the name of Stephen. And the charges against him as we come to this moment are charges of blasphemy. He is blasphemed according to Jewish law against Moses, against the temple, and against God. Basically, the charge is this, that he is speaking against all the traditions and the systems of the religious people. And we left last week with Stephen being arrested, and he was being charged, and all the while, there he sits, with what is recorded for us in the very last verse of chapter 6, with the face like the face of an angel. Why? How did that happen? Well, a man who is full of faith in the Holy Spirit has no need, faith family, to allow the circumstances of false accusation and protest to affect him. Did you hear me? Young people, did you hear me? A person who is full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit has no need to allow the circumstances of false accusation and false protests to affect him. A person who is full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit is not worried about the gossip and the accusations that others are being made of them for he knows in whom he belongs and whom he is. As a matter of fact, I would say this. A man who is full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit when encountering such persecution may even in the midst of a persecution find the ability to rejoice. Rejoice. To find joy again. Re-joy. To rejoice. Why are they able to rejoice? Because they see themselves as being considered worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. We saw this in chapter 5. How will Stephen defend himself against such accusations? How would we defend ourselves against such accusations? What we are going to do now is we are going to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Now, when I began to study this, I began to read this passage, and I was almost persuaded to break this up into two messages for one reason and one reason only. Length. His defense is a full 53 verses. Actually, his defense is a yeah, full 53 verses verses. But the more I thought on it, the more convinced I have become to keep his defense together its an entirety. Therefore, this morning we will be reading a longer portion of Scripture than normal, so please, for those of you who, like myself, struggle with um, attention deficit, we're going to have to focus, Okay? We're going to have to focus on what we read and not get caught in the weeds, but to be able to see the forest despite the trees. I would encourage you is to have, a, um, to have a, a part of the Scriptures in your hands uh, because it's easier to follow along and not to get distracted. Your mind tends to not wonder as much when you're looking at me reading it because that gets awkward because you're like, then you start paying attention to my shirt and the color of my shirt and my pants and you're like, Why is he, what is he doing? Why did he walk from left to right? I know this because that's what I do. 
And um, I, should not, I should not project that onto you in any way. I apologize. Now, for those of you who have been with me for any length of time, I want to rest your hearts. Yes, we are going to get through all 53 verses this morning. So, if you have to go to lunch and come back, you're more than welcome to, for the next six hours, be, please be patient. I am joking. I hope. I hope. Uh, maybe I hope not. Maybe, maybe really my hope and my desire is for the Holy Spirit to come into this place and we don't stop worshiping for the next six hours and all of us would have such an experience of the Holy Ghost that we would just want to sit here and just like, you know, like uh, Peter, let's just build a temple right here, man. Let's just, let's just have it out, right? <laughs> but for those of us who are used to this rhythm, I don't think it's going to take six hours. Maybe three. So here we go. Ready? Acts chapter 7. We will be reading verse 1 through verse 53. Let us be reminded that this is the word of the Lord. The high priest said, are these things so? Before I go further, I want to remind us, if you weren't here last week, what does he mean? Is it true that you're blaspheming? Uh, let, me, let me point you back up to verse 13. This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene will destroy this place and alter the customs will which Moses handed down. This is what he's defending, okay? Just so you know. Verse 1 again. The high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to them, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran, from there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, and yet even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years and whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and the Jacob, the father uh, the and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him. And rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob his father and all his relatives to come to him, seventy-five persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in a tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. As the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose another king over Egypt who, nothing, who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and, not, and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's, in father's home. And after he had been set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learnings of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power and words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered to his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? 
But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You did not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I've heard these, their groans, and I've come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him but repudiated him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will, be, who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the work of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it is not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rumpas, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen it. And having received it in their turn, their, our fathers brought it in, uh, in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out and before our fathers until the day of the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the, for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for rep rep repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which of, you prof of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not. Keep it. That is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, as we study this passage this morning, God, I pray that we would be faithful. That we'd be faithful in preaching it and understanding it and, and, and grasping the reality of Stephen's defense. That, Father, we would see this word as authoritative in our lives, that God, we would understand what you are saying and that God, it would, uh, we would have a passion for it, to live it, to love it, to demonstrate it, to declare it. But God, with that authority and that passion, we would be, it would be demonstrated in humility and wisdom, with a freedom. God, may we be your people today. And I pray that you would be with your servant as I preach this word. And that, Father, you would give me words to say in the way in which to say it. And the Holy Spirit, you would guide our hearts for those of us who know you, that we would, Father, come to love you more. And God, for those in this place who are listening to my voice who may not know you, that they would see that it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has come now to provide salvation for us in his son Jesus, so that we may be saved. 
Father, I pray now that your Holy Spirit will do the work that only it can do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Hmm. After reading something that long, I feel like I've just eaten a good heavy dinner. I just want to take a nap, right? Anybody ready for a good nap? Don't answer that question. Don't answer that question. Don't answer that question. I've tried my best in, the, in, in your worship guide to give you an outline. I didn't give you a lot of space because, as you can tell, we have quite a lengthy passage with quite a few space. So um, you might need some help with this, but I hope that that will help you us. I will hope it will help us uh, begin to look at this. The first thing we're going to see is the defense of Stephen. Stephen stands and he's given a defense by giving an extemporaneous overview of God's story. Did you get that? Did you see that Stephen is standing in this place with no indication, no ideas that we have that he was able to, in some way, shape, or form, go back and do any type of research or resources? It's not like he, like myself, had a piece of paper that he had to take all his notes on. This is purely extemporaneous preaching from the brother. Now you wonder why when he was chosen that this was a man who was full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. Wisdom. A man who would have known, who would have had the reality of holding things of faith dear and knowing those things of faith. Why did he go back over God's entire story? And here's the reason. It's because understanding God's story provides everyone as understanding as what is currently happening. Because, let me remind you, the acronym HISTORY is HIS STORY. The reality of history, it's not an acronym, but HISTORY is HIS STORY. And for us to understand where we are, we have to know from where we came. And that's exactly what Stephen is doing here. He is showing and he is helping us to do this. I want you to remember that Stephen has been asked to defend himself. Defend himself against what? Speaking against the holy place, this temple and also speaking against the law and Moses and their custom. It's like, it's like one of the songs from the old movie Fiddler on the Roof. And it ends with, without our traditions, our lives would be as shaky as a fiddler on the roof. And this is what the people are struggling with. If you're coming in here and you're going to eliminate all of our traditions, all the things that we've built, accustomed, become accustomed to living by, if you're coming in here and saying you're going to destroy all of those things, our life is going to be shaken. And it, and it will be shaken. Or, or it's not that we are trying to shake all of your customs, but I'm telling your customs are come and they have found its fulfillment. That's different. I'm not saying that traditions are bad. No, actually many of them are very good. I love many of the traditions that we, that we hold on to. But faith family, when tradition blinds you to truth, it's very dangerous. When we build traditions that blinds us to being able to see what the truth is, then we are to immediately abandon our tradition and to accept and follow truth. Amen? Amen? Amen. So the first thing he's going to do in his defense is he's going to defend himself against speaking against Moses. He begins his defense of him speaking against Moses. In verses 2 through 34, he is actually defending himself through the, for this particular um, accusation. And he's going to do this by talking about deliverance. Because this is an important part of what he is trying and his message and what his message is actually, actually giving them. Remembering that Stephen was full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs, and the people were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So now he is going to come and defend this by giving a defense of these things. And the first thing he is going to start with in verses 2 through 8 is deliverance beginning with Abraham. Who is Abraham? Who would these men think Abraham is? Abraham is the forefather of the entire nation of, uh, of, of Israel. So he's going back to the beginning of the establishment of this nation. 
and showing them that I am not a man who have abandoned all that I've known. I am a man who knows exactly what I know. He's, he's basically laying it down. He's going, oh, you think I don't know this? You think I don't get this? Well, let me go back to Abraham. And that's exactly what he does. Why Abraham? Because it was with Abraham that God established his covenant. And Stephen is going to root God's faithfulness to the people whom he is speaking to. And what is he going to root them in? In this truth, that God chose Abraham not because of anything that he had done, but simply because he loved him. Do you think he needs to let these people know that? You were not chosen because of you. You were chosen because of God's love. And that's what he is saying. He is saying God was faithful to us. The entire identity of all of the people who are standing here accusing him is solely rooted in what? God's grace and love due to his sovereignty and his providence. Now, what would you think the average Jew would be saying to this? What would you think the average Israelite, what would these men of God, these, these men who are this council, this Sanhedrin, what do you think they would be saying when he says, let me tell you about Abraham. Abraham was the father of our nation. He, he was, uh, he, God chose him out of all the other nations. He established this covenant with him, and he made these promises that he was going to make him mighty and he was going to make him great. Yeah, that's what they, they'd be going... Yes, yes, I like this kid, this kid. I wonder if even, even Gamaliel's in there, you know, the older man, and he just kind of, hey, this kid knows what he's talking about. That's true, that's true. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Yeah, yeah, I like it. And then he's going to progress, and the covenant's going to progress through the patriarchs. And then he's going to share the story. And by the way, just, just so you don't miss it, I want you to notice that God promised that through this, in verse 6, he says, that his descendants would be as aliens in a foreign land and they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Don't miss that. Because that's going to come up in a minute. But don't miss that. That God has established his covenant with Abraham, but yet God also knew that his people would end up in, in bondage. Everybody with me? And then he's going to mention Joseph. And here he is. He's going to talk about deliverance through Joseph. God delivered his people through Abraham, and now he's going to deliver his people through Joseph in, in verses 9 through 16. In verses 9 through 10, Stephen shows that despite their identities being established in grace, the patriarchs find themselves growing what? Jealous. Why were the patriarchs jealous? Because God determined Joseph had a place of honor. Joseph was given a place of honor. Remember the dreams of Joseph? Joseph was given this place of honor, and now the patriarchs grew jealous of, the, uh, grew jealous of Joseph, and so they, they committed Joseph and sold him into slavery. And this will become a rhythm of Stephen's defense. He will consistently demonstrate God's faithfulness and man's depravity. And here, despite their jealousy, God was with Joseph. God took Joseph through all that he took him through. If you want to study this, go and read in the book of Genesis. And he rescues him, and he grants him favor, where God's people actually come to be delivered through who? Through Joseph, the very one whom they didn't like, whom God promised he would deliver them through. This is verses 11 through 16. That's exactly what he's saying. Y'all remember the story. There's this famine in the land. And God, uh, um, Pharaoh places Joseph in charge of all his land due to Joseph's capacity to interpret dreams. A famine predicted by Joseph hits the land, forcing the patriarchs to come to Egypt to beg for food before, guess who? Joseph. And then Joseph brings the entire family to Egypt. It's quite a remarkable story. You can hear them saying, you can almost hear them going, oh, yes, I, yeah, I, I love, the, I love the story of Abraham. That's one of my favorite. I love being God's chosen people. Oh, yeah, I, I love the story of Joseph. Joseph being that good, good Israelite, leading his people, you know, being that strong man. Uh, now, of course, of course, the part with the patriarchs selling him and, you know, lying to their dad. That probably wasn't too good. But I love the story. I love the story. 
And then next, Stephen is going to move to God's faithfulness by deliverance through Moses. And this is verses 17 through 34, noticing that he's getting more intense and more intense. Abraham had just very few verses. Joseph has a little, a little bit more verses. And then here comes his deliverance through Moses. And we have 17 through 34. In verse 17, the, the Bible says, but as the time of prime promise was approaching. What's the time of promise? What's the promise? Remember back what he told Abraham that I read for you again? That God's people were going to be put in slavery and yet they would be rescued in 400 years? This promise had come. The promise he made Abraham, and actually it's in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, that God's people would be enslaved, and it's exactly what happened. See, what Stephen is doing here is he is establishing how God has been faithful to his promise and to his people by continuously providing them deliverance. What he's doing is, is he's going, you know, God's story is a redeeming story. God's story is all about how God redeems his people. It has been his story since Abraham. It was his story through Joseph. And it was his story through Moses. God redeems his people. He is a deliverer. He has come to deliver his people from bondage, from, from, uh, from famine, from, uh, from no identity in Abraham, from no identity to identity, from no family to family. In Joseph, from having no opportunity for, uh, for uh, your needs not being met to all of your needs being met. From, Eat, from Moses, from being enslaved and not being free to being made free. And he did all of this for the purpose of delivering his people. And you almost get a sense that his people, all the people who sit around would go, yes, 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 God is faithful. You know, it's like, like what people say in our faith family. You know, when you say God is good, they go all the time and all the time, God is good. You know? You've heard this, right? God is faithful. Maybe even a few sitting in the council goes, you know, this guy really knows his stuff. This dude just, he just came out of nowhere and gave us almost the entire story of Israel. And then Stephen's going to remind them that despite God's faithfulness and his deliverance of his people to the place in which they are currently standing was all for the purpose of of demonstrating what it looks like to be His people. That's why God redeemed them. That's why God delivered them. The people of God demonstrated their dissension in, in verses 35 through uh, 43. Stephen reminds the people that our forefathers, whom you were accusing me of speaking against, even spoke against Moses himself. You remember this? This is, their, this is what they're saying. They're saying Stephen is speaking against Moses, and Stephen's going, wait, don't forget, your forefathers spoke against Moses. Do you remember that? The very one who God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer, performing many signs and miracles, the one whom God promised as a prophet through angelic proclamations, passed on living oracles or, or living prayers or living words of divine communication in response to what was requested. This Moses, our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him and they repudiated him in the days of Aaron and instead they worship an idol. So what did God do? What did God do? Verses 42 through 43. God turned away from them. Remember, it was due to the disobedience and the false worship of Moses, uh, of the false worship of God, that God turns away and He delivers His people. And all of this is saying, you say I speak against Moses? You're saying I don't know who Moses is? I know fully aware of who Moses is. And I also know fully aware of how we reacted to him. You see, Stephen, when he became a Christian, he did not, and when he followed Christ, he didn't abandon all he had come to know through the Torah. No, what he's going at here, what he's getting at, and we'll, fill, fill, we'll find this out, he's getting to this. He's saying, no, he was fully aware of all that's in the Old Testament, and he says, this is what Moses was all about. Moses was all about, he was, a, he was a type. He was pointing us to something. So 
that's his defense against Moses. He goes, I know who Moses is. I know exactly what Moses has done. I'm not speaking against Moses. Let me tell you what I think about Moses. So I wonder what they would be thinking. Sounds like he knows about Moses, right? So what's his next? What's the next thing he has to defend against? This holy place. Remember? He speaks against this holy place. Well, in verses 44 through 50, that's what you find him saying. He's going to give his defense of this holy place. He's going to give a history lesson. And where does he start? Moses. Our fathers had the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was directed to us by Moses. Our fathers brought it with them when Joshua defeats the nations. David found favor in God's sight and through his son Solomon, the very temple in which they are standing and talking about, was built. And he's saying, yeah, I know about this temple. And it's here Stephen offers his rebuke by quoting Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, in verses 49 and 50. Heaven is my throne and earth is, my fo- is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Why is this such an amazing chapter? If you were a Jew, you would know exactly where he's quoting from. This passage begins Isaiah's final chapter describing God's throne. When you go and you look at Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, it's the entire chapter describing one thing, where God is. You see, what did the Jews think? God meets us here. And what was he saying? God is on his throne. He always has been on his throne. He will be on his throne. Why? Why is he saying, why did Isaiah write this? Because in the previous chapter, in chapter 65 of Isaiah, read it for yourself, great homework, Isaiah speaks of how they are rebellious people. So what is, what is he saying? The Jew would understand this. They would say, wait, in 65 it says that we are rebellious people. We have rebelled against God. And now Isaiah, the prophet, comes in and he says, but yet God will bring about the new heavens and the new earth. This temple you prize so dearly was built by Solomon, but the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. So what is he getting at? You think I speak against Moses? Let me tell you what I think about Moses. You think I'm speaking against the temple? Let me tell you what I think about the temple. And by the way, yeah, we could spend weeks on this whole passage. But I say all this to say that's the big picture. That's what Stephen is defending himself. So then how does he answer? First he defends and now he's going to rebuke. Here's the rebuke of Stephen, verses 51 through 53. Stephen turns and he describes these men in three very distinct ways. Notice how he calls them. First, stiff-necked. Resistant, obstinate, stubborn, hard-headed. You refuse to bow to God. Do you ever remember him calling anybody stiff-necked? Listen to this. Moses was up on Mount Sinai. He is coming down from the mountain. When he comes down from the mountain, guess what's built? The golden calf. And this is what he says. This is in Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. These are some obstinate people. What is he doing? Do you see what Stephen just did? He just said, the very people, you're accusing me of not knowing about Moses, you're like the people who are stiff-necked against Moses. Moses. 
Second, you are uncircumcised in heart. Uncircumcised in heart. Surely, physically, they show signs of circumcision. But their hearts are far from God. You ever had that? You ever seen that? Outside, they play the part, but their hearts are far from God. I would say the reason that many people who, who go to church today are struggling in their sin so much is because they are trying to conform themselves to an identity outside instead of allowing their hearts to be circumcised and changed, instead of moping their hearts up to being motivated and moved. We've gotten good in the church at behavior modification. Instead of allowing the gospel to lead people to repentance and faith. So first, they were stiff-necked. Second, they are uncircumcised in heart. And third, your ears always resisting the Holy Spirit. You refuse to listen to what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you. He's saying God has worked through His people over and over with repeated acts of mercy, and they have hardened themselves, they have stiffened their neck, and they have stopped listening to the Word and work of God. And then Stephen, Stephen says this, you are doing just like your forefathers did. Look back at the prophets. Look at the prophets. How did your forefathers treat the prophets? They killed those who announced the coming of the righteous one. What about Jeremiah? You know how they killed him? You remember? They stoned him to death. What about Isaiah? Do you remember how they killed Isaiah? They sawed him in half. And, and he's saying, he's saying, listen, you are just like them. You're accusing me of not of speaking against Moses and the law. No, 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 no. I'm speaking for Moses and the law. You are just like them. You're just like the ones who rejected Moses. You're just like the ones who rejected Jeremiah. You are just like the ones who rejected Isaiah. Now, there's, this is up for, up for conversation, but some people, they make Stephen angry here. They make Stephen out, you know, he's hollering at him. I don't think he is. I don't think Stephen's hollering at him. Why do I not think that? We'll see that next week. Because when I see next week, I don't think Stephen is speaking in anger because of the way he responds to their persecution of him. I think Stephen is speaking compassionately. I, th I think Stephen is going, why are you so hard-headed? You're uncircumcised in heart. You're, you're still who you were. You're, you're stiff-necked. You're hard-headed. You're, you're uncircumcised in heart. You're resisting. You, you, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to what the Holy Spirit is doing or has done. Remember, we're in the book of what? Acts. Now, many, many people want to say this is the Acts of the disciples. The Acts of, okay, I think it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I think it's showing us how the Holy Spirit works, and that's what he's saying. You are resisting what the Holy Spirit is doing because all of this you received was ordained. It was provided by angels and you did not keep it. All this history was culminating in one person, the righteous one. Don't forget that name. The righteous one. And through all this history that God is doing, all of His deliverance culminating in the righteous one, you did not keep it. All of that which you have done was all very religious, but it was all very wrong. All of the things that we have was pointing and preparing us for the only one who could live the life that we couldn't live. The Messiah. The righteous one. Jesus. Now next week we're going to see how the people respond. But can I say this? What courage. What courage. Do we have the courage when accusations come up against us 
First, do we have the faith to be resolved in ourselves that we know who God is and who we are in light of that? Second, do we have the courage to stand up with hearts of compassion and to call people to faith and belief in the only one who can save them? Say, family, when the king of my heart is the fire in my veins, the echo of my days, there is a sense of fearlessness. Can I say this? You have to fear no man if you fear God. You don't need the approval of any other man if you fear God. So what is it we see here? First, we see with God... We see that there, God is slow to anger and eager to forgive and restore a broken people. Can y'all see this? Can y'all see that your God is a God who is slow to anger and eager to forgive and to restore a broken people? That God demonstrated His compassion on His people again and again and again and again and again and again and again. From his very establishing the covenant with a people due to simple love filled grace. A people who could see the grace of God for them in Abraham, but can't rejoice in God's grace uh, on, uh, for others. God in his providence takes their rejected redeemer in Joseph and extends his gracious hand on him in light of the jealousy of the patriarchs. And then God provides them a deliverer in Moses and the people reject him. It's the story we see over and over and over and over again. God is gracious towards Abraham for no other reason than by grace. And it's those very people who are in the lineage of Abraham who think now... I am the favored one. Instead of extending that grace to the rest of the world, what do they do? They begin to take that grace upon themselves and make it their own, and they become obstinate. In Joseph, they, they find a redeemer, and they have somebody who, will, who God has chosen to redeem them, and instead of accepting that, they get angry, and they throw him into a pit, and they hate him for, uh, for being who God has called him to be. And Moses, oh my goodness, Moses, a deliverer who actually delivers them from slavery. And they go back and they say, I don't want to have nothing to do with this Moses. I don't even know where he is. Let's, within 40 days. Now, y'all, y'all are thinking, I know, I, know, I, know, I know how this works. Y'all are thinking that I would never do that. Man, if I would have saw all those plagues, if I would have been at the Passover, if I would have, bro, if I would have seen the Red Sea part, <laughs> you hear me? It would have taken me a lot longer than 40 days. It would have taken me a lot longer than 40 days to, to, to uh, not have faith in who God is and the man in which he called. Really? Really? Mark this. Jesus has risen from the grave and has shown himself to be true and faithful. I guarantee you some of you by Monday will done forget it. You might not even make it out this building before you forget it. So before you look at them and go, no, nah, man, if I saw all that, you need, to, you need to simmer down. Simmer it on down. Because I don't know about you, but I know it only takes one person to bump into my bottle before my bottle spills out anger and frustration. And I totally forget about who God is, what He's done, who am I in light of what He's done and what am I to do. It doesn't take much, does it, y'all? It doesn't take much. It is in the story that we see God is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Stephen's defense is rooted in the historical narrative of who God is and what He's done. And faith family, that is why I am such a strong advocate for understanding the story of God. Knowing God's story. Knowing the entirety of God's story from Genesis to Revelation. Understanding why God has done what He's done and what He's up to. This is why one of the first things I, I, I admonish all of our uh, missional communities to do is to learn what? God's story. Learn His story. But I want to say this. In light of God's patience and love, 
There is a place where one can come to resisting the Holy Spirit so far for so long until God will do like He did with His people in the Old Testament and He will give you over to the desires of your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, in the moment where there no longer remains any conviction or guilt or shame for your sin, you would be entirely handed over to it. I have seen it happen over and over and over and over. The gospel is being proclaimed. People can sit under the authority of God's word, hearing it preached day after day after day, but their stiff-necked, obstinate, uncircumcised hearts have them leaving out of every room, leaving out of every sermon, unchanged, unmattered, un, 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 uh, un, un, unfazed by anything that has been said, until the day comes when God says, you know, Donnie, if that's what you want, you can have it. Dear brothers and sisters, I call you to this truth. We live in a culture that precipitates the idea that you can be anybody you want to be, you can do anything you want to do. We have allowed this jargon and nonsense to enter into the church, into our parenting, all as a means of encouragement. I was sitting with a drug addict just a few months ago, addicted to heroin and meth. And as she sat there and I sat next to her, she began to ask me, Pastor, what is it going to take? What is it going to take? And I said, Listen to me. You need to deny yourself. You need to trust in Christ. And you're going to have to follow Him. Because let me tell you, the worst thing that you can have right now is the desire of your heart. I pray on a frequent basis. God, may I not get the desires of my heart. May I get the desires of your heart. God, I want what you want for my life, and whatever that may mean. Now, for those of you here who are, who are hooked up to the health, wealth, and uh, prosperity gospel, right now, I know what you got to preach. you got to preach Stephen is going to get healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. you got to. Matter of fact, this gospel ends right now. Chapter 7 is over for the health well. You ain't never heard no Joel Olstein preach from Acts chapter 7. You hear me? Because he ain't got nothing for this. What are you going to say now? What do you think is going to happen next week? You think, you think Stephen's now going to, ooh, he done preached the truth and now freedom, freedom. No, 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 no. You're going to find out. And I am here to declare to you, in light of God's patience and love, there is a place where one can resist the Holy Spirit for so long, and then God will give you over to the desires of your heart. In the moment you, you no longer, there no longer remains any conviction or guilt or shame for sin in your life, and instead you're t in, high, handed entirely over to it. Here's the way it sounds, just in case you're wondering. You begin to find ways to justify yourself, demonstrating you no longer see your need to be justified before God in Christ. You no longer need any, you don't need God anymore. You got this. I don't need justification. I don't need God to stand in my place. I got this. Some of you are in here and you know you've sinned this week and you've been struggling with it and you're going, uh-oh, how do I know if I'm there? How do I know if God is giving me over? Ladies and gentlemen, if you are still experiencing guilt for your sin, if you are still able to repent, then I'm telling you, God is still pursuing you to God be the glory. 
The reality that God is slow to wrath doesn't mean there is no wrath. As a matter of fact, what do we see in Christ that we see God's love and wrath simultaneously brought to us as He, the righteous one, was crucified and through this, you and I might be saved. That in Jesus we discover the culmination of all of redemptive history finding its resolution. It's amen if you will allow me to. For now, you and I are able to be a part of this redemptive story. And that's what Stephen is getting at. All of this story from Abraham to Joseph to Moses has been now found and redeemed in the righteous one, the only one, righteous by the way, the only one who could do what is right, the only one who lived the perfect life that we could never live, and by the way, the only one who died the death that we deserve, deserve to die. All of redemptive history, all of God redeeming His people, being patient with His people, loving His people, being gracious with them, moving them, also, also punishing them and disciplining them because God loves those whom He disciplines, drawing them all through them, giving them the desires of their heart so the desires of their heart reveal that their heart is desperately wicked and in need of God. That's what we see in Judges, right? God gives them what they want. They do what they want. It ends up broken. They come back to God, and then it becomes this cycle all over again. All of this redemptive history is to be found, completed in what? Jesus. And I got good news for you. You and me now have the opportunity to be a part of this redemptive story. We are, to, we are redeemed, as the song goes, to redeem the world around us. So we stand in the lineage of men like Abraham. We stand in lineage of men like Joseph, and David, and Stephen. May God's story so encompass our lives that if we were to ask to give a defense of the hope that is in us, we would be able to do so. And may we be courageous in that. Will you please stand to your feet? As we prepare ourselves now for, for responding to this word, I ask that if you're in here and you're an unbeliever, let me kind of share with you what we'll be doing in the next few moments. In the next few moments, we, are, we ask, how do we respond? For those who are unbelievers, you respond by faith. You come to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You trust in Him. You give your life to Him. And you repent and you believe that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who came, was born of a virgin, lived the perfect life, died, in, uh, was buried in a tomb for three days, rose again, as uh, ascended to the right hand of the Father, where He currently sits and He will soon return. If you can place your faith in Him, you repent right where you are and you believe and you be saved. And you become a part of the redemptive history of God. For those of us who are believers, how do we respond? We respond by reminding ourselves all that Jesus has done and we do the Lord's Supper. We bring the bread and we bring the, the fruit of the vine and we bring both of those together to us and we go, God, let us remind ourselves all of this message. Let us remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us. We do ask that if you are an unbeliever, this is the Lord's Supper. So if you don't call Him Lord, you don't participate in this supper. You're more than welcome to come and to watch and to be a part, but we're just asking for you not to participate in this supper. Next few moments, what we're going to do is we're going to spend just some time in quiet, each of us, as we go before God, responding to this word that we have heard. For those of us who are believers, we come repenting for our sanctification so that we would be made more like Him. And for those who are unbelievers, you come repenting in justification so that you can come to be in Him. So as we are here, faith family, may we now go before our great God and King so that we do not enter this table at an unworthily manner. Let us pray.
our great King, the Righteous One, the One in whom all the Old Testament prophecies come to find its truth and fulfillment. The One in whom said, I will raise this temple in three days. The one in whom all the fulfillment of Abraham's covenant promise was found. The one in whom Joseph's hope was discovered. The one in whom Moses' proclamation would come. Father, we come before you now and ask for you to meet us here. That God, as we partake now in these elements, that Father, we would be reminded of all that you've done, dear Jesus. And with a story like this, if there's one thing that we want to walk out of here encouraged in, it is that those who are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit are able to have a courage that is just a fearlessness that is beyond all comprehension. God, may we be men like Stephen. Would you draw us to yourself? Would we so know you that if the accusations were to come, that we would be able to sit with a face like the face of an angel, knowing that we have been in your presence? If we were to be accused of trusting in you, that God, we would be found guilty. And Jesus, that you would lead us into all righteousness and you would help us to defend ourselves according to your word. And yes, dear Lord, even if it means the taking of our lives, that we would be found faithful. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord, in which, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name. Amen.